And what I found, which was fascinating, is every criticism of North Korea, North Korea has a response to. Uh, sometimes those responses are horrific in, in a very darkly humorous way. For example, when the UN recently attacked them for their concentration camps and human rights abuses, their literal response is, we don't use the term concentration camps, so therefore we don't have any. Um, and in the same way that they have Juche architecture and Juche sports, they say, well, well, our definition of human rights is national sovereignty, so when you criticize our nation, you're violating our human rights. Now, how are you going to respond to a country that does not negotiate in good faith? That's the question that the world has been grappling with for many decades. Um, and the question was, how are you going to have someone hand over the leadership to their son? Well, their argument goes, look, uh, Stalin gave way to Khrushchev, and he ruined the whole revolution. So only someone who is a, as much of a successor as the predecessor can carry the revolution through to the generations until the very end. Um, in the 80s, uh, Seoul, you know, North Korea and South Korea were still not member states of the UN. China was blocking South Korea being allowed into uh, the UN. At one point, Seoul was granted the Summer Olympics. And Kim Jong-il got on the phone. He goes, hey, wouldn't it be great if we shared the Olympics, you know, this would be a great sign of Korean unity. You know, national uh, um, uh, reunification is something we both want. And Seoul said, well, you don't have the facilities, number one. Number two is the, UN, the, the Olympic Committee granted us to us, not to both of us. And they granted to a city, not to a country. And Kim Jong-il said, come on. And they go, we, we can't do this. We're not interested. He goes, come on. He goes, OK. So what did Kim Jong-il do? So he got two spies, and they boarded a plane in uh, Europe, and they put a bomb safely in their overhead compartment, and they got off in Bahrain at the layover, and that plane blew up uh, uh, and killed many, many people on board, um, which is why the North Koreans were on the state-sponsored terrorism list until fairly recently. Uh, and as a result of this, you know, this was their t attempt to, to kind of ruin the South Korean Olympics. And as a consequence, he launched his own Communist Olympics, the People's Festival of Freedom, and, and so on and so forth. And that was kind of the acme of the North Korean uh, experiment. After that, you had the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union would subsidize North Korea, and China would as well. Kim Il-sung was great at playing them against each other. I'm trying to, oh, I'm running out of time. Wow, OK, we're not going to, OK. Um, what they would do is the Russians would send the North Koreans oil, and the North Koreans would send the Russians like crappy socks, and they would call it a friendship crisis, and they say it's a wash. As, a, as after uh, the USSR fell, there was nothing the North Koreans had that the Russians wanted or that any other country wanted, and it was an exact inversion of, Henry ha of, of um, Leonard Reed's eye pencil. Because what happened was, without oil, you couldn't run the factories. Without the factories, you couldn't produce fertilizer. Without fertilizer, you can't grow crops in an extremely mountainous country. Uh, the North Koreans launched a campaign called Let's Eat Two Meals a Day Instead of Three, because having three meals a day is unhealthy, so this was a good thing that there wasn't much food. Uh, the great leader Kim Il-sung died, and Kim Jong-il took over. And perhaps being the most honest politician on Earth, his campaign slogan actually was, do not expect any change from me. <laughs> But there was change, and it was what they called the arduous march, because without food, people started eating grass, then they started eating bark, then they started eating weeds, and it got to the point where they were eating saccharin just to have some food in their bellies. And this, the twisted part of this regime is those who were faithful were the first ones to starve, because they thought the dear leader is going to take care of us, food is right around the corner. You had one to two million people starve in North Korea. This was very much an intentional genocide. Kim Jong-il said having too many people makes socialism difficult. And he said explicitly, uh, if we allow the UN to bring in food, then the government's going to be superfluous. So as the population of North Korea you know, descended into uh, uh, hunger, you had mass diseases coming back. They even had polio return uh, in the 90s. And of course, this was all the fault of the US imperialists. Uh, what, when the UN came, they were not allowed to have any Korean speakers on, on their staff, and they would take them to Village A on Monday, and they showed them some healthy people, and they took them to Village B on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, they went back to Village A. And when the UN said, we were just here Monday, they were said, no, you weren't. And the UN eventually left, and, and that's how dark things have gone. That's why North Korea opened themselves up to tourism in exchange to try to get hard currency. And I totally misunderestimated how much time I have, but let me try to get things through as quickly as possible. Now, North Korea, like most of these communist states, have a, 
uh, constitution, which is in this case for display purposes only, North Korea is actually governed by the Ten Commandments of the great leader Kim Il-sung, the tenth of which says, the revolution shall be continued through the generations until the end. What that means in practice is only a blood descendant of the great leader Kim Il-sung can be leader. So very recently, when Kim Jong-un took over for his father, Kim Jong-il, he murdered his elder brother, Kim Jong-nam, in that Malaysian airport because there, now there's no Mike Pence. Now there's no one to take over. This is an insurance policy. Uh, and people often ask, you know, why can't you have a military coup? Because there's no precedent for any, other, so any person to be in charge other than the leader. And there is a sense of divinity about the leadership. It's not in the same way as there being a god, but I guess the, a good parallel would be how Americans think of Uncle Sam, this kind of mythical figure that travels around and, um, and solves problems. I, when I was doing the research for the book, uh, the, the fables are extremely monotonous. Um, I'll tell you a couple of, of anecdotes. There's one meeting, and Kim Jong-il is sitting there taking notes, and his assistant is telling him things, and there's a speaker, and the speaker keeps stopping, and Kim Jong-il goes, why do you keep stopping? And he goes, well, you're, you're talking to your assistant, you're taking notes. And he says, well, I could do all these three things at once. And they said, well, from that point on, they saw that Kim Jong-il doesn't look at time as a plane, but as a cube, and that he has the capacity to shrink time. And my friend goes, does he mean multitasking? And yes, that is what he means. And he's apparently the only person in North Korea who's capable of doing such a thing. Um, when they were building their obelisk, you know, in, in, that I mentioned earlier, the Tower of the Tree idea, uh, it was his idea to make it the tallest stone obelisk on Earth, which no one had ever considered before. So in my book, I just have this story of you imagine these architects, and, and they didn't even consider it. And they're like, let's make it the second tallest. And Kim Jong-il's the one who's be like, let's make it the tallest. They're like, what a genius. It's just amazing. And there's anecdotes of these. They open an amusement park, and he's so brave because he wants to make it safe for the elderly and the kids that he rides every ride twice, even though there's a light rain, while all the people who are associated with him, his helpers, are standing there crying at his bravery. So there is a certain madness to it. And, and speaking of how their art works, I asked my mom about this. You know, I was born in the Soviet Union. Uh, Kim Jong-il hates the Mona Lisa. And I asked her, why does Kim Jong-il hate the Mona Lisa? And it took her two seconds, and she goes, because of her ambiguous smile. And that's exactly right. So according to North Korean propaganda, all art has to be completely unambiguous and completely uh, uh, clear to all the masses, which as a consequence is mind-numbingly pedantic and boring and incredibly hard to sit through, which is why so much of uh, North Korean government in current times is losing their hold on power because as more when the when the, the famine hit, those guards on the border were hungry themselves. So people would go to China, you give the border guard a cut, uh, you now you're exposed to Chinese information, and you come back and it costs nothing to spread information. And now there's an understanding in North Korea that they are not the richest country on earth, that other countries have it far better. And this is a very, very big problem for the regime. They've allowed black markets as a means, which is not capitalism somehow. Uh, in their logic, uh, which is a means to keeping people fed because the government is utterly incapable of doing so nowadays. Um, let's talk about the, you know, the contemporary things with, uh, there's a lot more to cover, obviously, but let's talk about more of the contemporary things with President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. Um, you know, the North Koreans, when, when legends about why Kim Jong-il got the leadership position is he was sitting down with the great leader Kim Il-sung and all the generals and they said, well, what happens if the U.S. imperialists invade again? And the general said, we'll, we'll kill him, we'll kill him, we're going to win. And the great leader Kim Il-sung says, well, what if we don't win? And they're stunned because they can't even consider such a possibility. And Kim Jong-il says, if we lose, we will destroy the world. And Kim, Kim Il-sung says, spoken like a real supreme commander. So Kim Jong-il's uh, iteration of Juche was what he called Sun-gun, which means uh, military first, which includes military eats first. And the premise is it's the military that keeps the country uh, safe and secure and allows for their freedom. Uh, it has the fourth largest military on Earth. And his idea was, in order to fight the Chinese dragon and the Russian bear and the American wolf, I have to turn North Korea into a hedgehog and by which he meant an animal with spines, missiles, going in every direction. So these claims of denuclearization have to be taken with a, a huge amount of skepticism because so much of their ideology for so long has been the US imperialists are going to invade and kill us all at any minute, but for our leader. And again, they have all these uh, um, exhibits about how cruel and torturous we were during the Korean War. I don't need to tell anyone in this room how horrific war is uh, to a population. This wasn't that long ago. And then again, in the 90s, you had this famine, which was the Americans' fault. So they have a huge 
uh, enormous suspicion uh, of the Americans with good reason. So it, it's a very, very um, uh, dark, obviously, situation. I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, what I am pleased with is how President Trump is realizing, if, if you're dealing with a hostage situation, right, and this is very much a hostage situation, you have 25 million hostages, there's two types of bank robbers. There's the bank robber who runs in the bank and starts shooting up people, and there's the bank robber that runs in the bank and starts shooting up the ceiling. Now, obviously, you want to deal with the second one. This is someone who might be not respecter of property rights, but he's not a wanton mass murderer. So when North Korea fires their missiles, they're always firing them into the ocean. Uh, they're not firing them at Seoul. They're not firing them at Tokyo. This is very much by design. And one of the big arguments that people had for years, and, and thankfully has very much changed recently, is that North Korea is crazy and North Korea is suicidal. Well, if they're suicidal, how are they the last ones left? They're obviously pretty bad at being suicidal when it's just them and Cuba, when so many of these other communist states have fallen away. So uh, I, I'm going to wrap it up here. I know there's a lot more to cover because I'm running out of time. But uh, I'll have time for questions later because this is a, an extremely complicated uh, and dark subject. But thankfully, things are getting better specifically because of information, specifically because so many people have been refugees and are in contact with people in North Korea. Uh, it used to be the world's largest consumer of VCRs. Uh, then they went to CDs, and now they use memory sticks. So one of the tricks that the North Korean government used to do is they would turn off the power in someone's house, then go inspect it. That way you can't e eject a DVD, and you could see what the people are watching. And, and God help you if it's something you know, religious, something like that. There are there's certain movies that they really like, like Titanic. Titanic sank the day that the great leader Kim Il-sung was born. That's true, which is, I suppose, a victory of communism over evil capitalism. Um, <laughs> They like Jane Eyre. Uh, it, it's, it's very odd. But it's also fascinating and counterintuitive how what they do know and what they don't. For example, when I was there, I asked my guide if she knew about 9-11. And she rolled her eyes. And she's like, of course. They showed us on television, which in retrospect makes perfect sense. But I told her the fable, the Aesop's fable of the frog and the scorpion. And she didn't know what a scorpion was. I'm like, OK, it's a language barrier. And then I drew it for her. And she had no idea. She never heard of it. Because there's no scorpions in North Korea, so they don't teach them about it. right? Whereas I was thinking, how many ways do I know about scorpions, comic books, TV shows, nature, you know, it's, it's the zodiac. So it's just fascinating when you're there, which is impossible to describe, uh, what they know and what they don't and what's allowed through. And when you're in North Korea, everywhere you look, like here, if you look in this room, you've got the clock, you've got the lights, you've got the, this, you've got the tables. Everything is there obviously selected for a purpose. And it, it, you don't know why it's there. You know what I mean? It's just some things are very intuitive and obvious. And some are like I, we went to this place in the middle of the highway for some reason, and there was a balcony with corn husks on it. I, to this day, have no idea what those corn husks were for, uh, what they were going to be used for. So um, I guess I will just wrap it up by saying, uh, and again, this is not going to be news to anyone in this room, uh, the, the best comparison of the North Korean leadership is, is the Batman villain, the Joker, in that, yes, in one very literal sense, this person is a clown, but this clown has an enormous amount of bodies behind them. And it's important to us when we're dealing with this issue to always remember the continuing plight of the North Korean people, where right now, as we speak, there's 25 million people wearing this lapel pin while they leave their house and are in constant fear uh, for their entire family being taken away at the moment's notice. Thank you.